So without any further ado, go and grab some paper and a pen. We're going to have our cheesy intro music. Okay, so welcome back. Thank you for that. It's not going to be a difficult or complicated one today. You'll be very pleased to know. I know some of these topics have been fairly long going. The last one definitely was. Um, but today we're going to look at the question of can we trust religious experiences, which obviously hinges a little bit on what we talked about last time as well. So today we're going to explore Swinburne's principle of credulity and testimony. And it's going to be good if we can describe what the principles of credulity and testimony are. It's going to be great if we can explain some of the issues surrounding credulity and testimony and even better if we can evaluate if you think these arguments add anything to our understanding of religious experiences. So during today's session we're going to look at Swinburne, we're going to do a Y diagram, uh, we're going to look at some issues and then come back to Swinburne and see what he actually says himself as well. So this is Richard Swinburne, born in 1934. Uh, he says that the existence of God can't be proven by logical argument. So he would there totally obviously disagree with the ontological argument, which is trying to prove it by logic. So he says that you can't prove God's existence. What it is, it's about probability. And he says that if I can experience something, then it probably is true. A stove is probably hot. OK, you can't guarantee it to be hot because he's not going to touch every single stove in existence. But a hob is probably hot. He knows that pain can be reduced through ice, or at least that's probable in most cases. Music is probably produced by a musician or an artist. OK, so he says that there are some things that we know to be probably true. However, they're not necessarily provable. So, for example, if I asked you to define what beauty was, you could probably define it, but you wouldn't be confident in your outcome for that definition. So what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at some of the issues that are associated with this. To do that, I would like you on your page to construct a Y diagram. It looks like that. So you split your April page into three. You've got the principle of credulity on the left, the principle of testimony on the right, and issues at the top. So pause this now if you need to, and let's get that drawn out. OK, so the principle of credulity is how do you judge something? How do you know something to be true? So thinking back to Bernadette Suvaru, what is it you would say to her to say, how do you know that what happened to you was real and not just your brain doing things? So we've got a number of principles that Swinburne comes up with, and this is going to go in the left hand box, the principle of credulity. So the first one is about the reliability of the claim. Just because um, the person may have told a lie in the past, doesn't necessarily mean that it is a lie this time round. So you've got to make a judgment about how reliable is it what they're saying. Is it something that is likely to be true or is it something that is likely to be false? That's not judging them as a character, that's judging the claim that they are talking about. The second one then links with that is the truth about the claim. Can it be verified beyond reason? Okay, so just because something might have been false or misunderstood before doesn't mean that it's been false or misunderstood this time. So someone might make a claim which you might say, OK, we know it to be reliable or it seems to be reliable. And do we do we think we can verify their existence? So we can't look at their previous times. We can only look at this particular time and say, could it have been false or misunderstood what happened? So the Saul Paul conversion experience, could that have occurred but be misunderstood by Saul when he converted. When you think of Nicky Cruz, could that have been proven in Nicky Cruz's mind? 
or is it something you'd say he's misunderstood? His third point was, was God's present in the experience? Well, it might be difficult to prove that God is everywhere. So it's actually up to the doubter, this is um, Swinburne's idea, it's up to the doubter to prove that God was not there, not the believer to prove that God was there. Let me say that again, so Swinburne's very clear on this. He says it's up to the doubter to prove that God was not there, rather than the believer to prove that God was there. So he's quite confident in the idea that there was in fact a God within the experience. And lastly, he would say, can it be explained in other ways? In other words, God underpins everything that we do and has created nature according to Swinburne. So it is perfectly normal for God to be within a religious experience because God has created nature that way. William James would agree, if you remember back to William James, that we did. So that's the principle of credulity. Make sure you're really clear on that. I know I've gone over that really quickly, but it's not massively complicated. So our next one then is the principle of testimony. Okay, so the principle of testimony. I want you to think about this question. Who would you say is trustworthy in your school or your college? Okay, who is trustworthy? and who has integrity. Swinburne would suggest that the principle of testimony, which is about the idea of believing in someone, and I'm not saying believing them to put your life on the line, but believing that what they say to be true, is that you should believe in such people unless there's a reason not to. So I've used this example previously, I'll use it again, that there was one evening I've looked up and I believe I saw some UFOs flying around. Now, that is because I'm a trustworthy person, you should believe that I've had that experience. Now, you might doubt the credulity of that, which goes back to my previous idea. But if you trust me as a person, then you're going to trust that I believe that I have this experience. Now, the question is, would you have a reason to not believe me, not trust my testimony? Well, you might ask where I was and I was stood outside a pub. At that point, then you could start to say that that particular experience probably isn't trustworthy. But if it is someone to, you know to be reliable and honest, then you will trust them. So again, like with credulity, he would say that it's the skeptic that has to take the burden of disproof, not the experiencer who is okay to have the burden of proof. So if anyone's going to try and dispute anything, it needs to be the skeptic. So. Swinburne comes up with three principles for this one. He says that someone has a religious experience of what seems to be God. The principle of credulity would suggest it probably would be God because the principle of testimony is that you trust that person. He says that there are multiple testimonies to support this. Lots of people say they have experiences of God. Because lots of people say they have those experiences, those experiences are more likely to be true. If I was to sit in a classroom, for example, and get my kettle on, make myself a cup of tea and then get my bacon butty out and start eating that in front of the entire class because there's been multiple people that have said that that's happened it is more likely to be true than just one person saying it and the rest of them saying that it didn't happen so if multiple testaments are saying to me then it is quite likely to be true without religious experience the probability of the existence of god is about 50 50 that's swinburne's idea without religious experiences the probability of the existence of God is about 50-50. What he says, though, is that if we add testimony to it, the probability becomes greater. And therefore, Swinburne would say that is why God probably exists. Because you say on balance, with the principle of testimony, with the principle of credulity, you've got to trust people. And if you trust people and you believe what they're talking about, then it is quite likely that God exists. Our third box then is the issues that are associated with it. As with all A-level, you need to be able to argue from the opposite viewpoint. So, just because normal sense experience is true, doesn't, however, make supernatural experience also true. So it's like you comparing going on an aeroplane to being on a boat. Those two experiences are totally different. They might both be transport, but they're totally different. So what's being suggested here is that normal sense experience might be true, but that doesn't mean that supernatural experience is also true. Those two things are very, very different beasts. It also says that some things are verifiable by others, but religious experiences are not verifiable because they're deeply personal. 
Now, because they're deeply personal, the principle of testimony and credulity may not come into play because you can't trust them even if you can trust the person because they're deeply personal. And lastly, just because you believe something to be true doesn't necessarily make it being true by itself. So what we're going to do is just do a quick recap and then we're going to uh, end by looking at what Swinburne says himself. So we said it'd be good if you could describe what the principles of credulity and testimony are. Hopefully you can do that now. Uh, great if you could explain some of the issues surrounding credulity and testimony. And we've just talked about that. And even better if you can evaluate if you think these arguments add anything to the understanding of religious experiences. And that is for you to make those judgments. So when you get to uh, your AO1 and AO2 questions, then you can start to really think about that and throw um, Swinburne in as well because we've caught a lot of people during this unit. Now that was the last part of this unit, so I'm, I'm sure there'll be an exam question next that your teacher may well set you. I'm certainly gonna do that. But let's end with looking at what Richard Swinburne himself says about these principles. So I'm gonna hand over to him now, but thank you for your time. Take care, wash hands, stay safe, God bless. I'll see you soon. Here's Richard Swinburne to explain why he thinks credulity is rational. It's always, in my view, always rational to believe that things are the way they seem to be in the absence of counter-evidence. Um, uh, there's a number of words for this principle. I call it the principle of cred credulity. That is to say, the rational person is the credulous person, the person who believes everything in the absence of counter-evidence. Why? And what does Swinburne even mean when he uses the word believe? Why would it not be more rational to be agnostic about whether things are the way they superficially seem to be in the absence of counter-evidence? I think it would be reasonable to suspect that things are the way they seem to be, but I don't see why it's rational to have more than a mere suspicion. I don't see why it's rational to fully believe everything in the absence absence of counter evidence. Also, I know I keep harping on parsimony, but whether you should believe that something is the way it seems to be depends at least in part on whether how things seem to be is the simplest explanation for one's experience. Um, so, I mean, you're right to believe that you're sitting in a chair interviewing me. You don't need an argument for that. It's so obvious. Yeah, but the existence of a god is not so obvious as to even remotely be analogous to the obviousness of being where one seems to be and doing what one seems to be doing. Um, and like, but of course, it is. somebody can uh, <laughs> wake you up and show you're only having a dream, that would show you were mistaken. So the principle is always... In the absence of counter evidence, it's rational to believe things are what they see. So, persons brought up in a cl closed religious community and, and has a deep religious experience, it's obvious to him there's a God, he's right to believe it. Fair enough. If a person is ignorant of all of the psychological factors that can induce such experiences, I guess I couldn't blame them for coming to such a conclusion. But this simply doesn't apply to most educated people and is also probably inapplicable to many lay people as well. But uh, he may come out into the outside world and be presented with counter arguments and then he may need to consider them if uh, his religious experience isn't very strong and these arguments seem appealing. Um, Likewise, it's it's rational to believe as a god if if uh, <laughs> the wisest person in your community tells you there's a god and there's no other person to tell you there's a god because it's always rational to believe what people tell you in the absence of counter evidence. Okay, I definitely don't buy that. However, even if I did, these arguments seem to only apply to someone who is in a hypothetical state of general ignorance. If someone doesn't know that religious experiences can be psychologically induced. If they live in some isolated community where the wisest person is a theist. Swinburne's argument seems to boil down to saying it's rational to believe in a god if you're in a context of severe intellectual poverty.